In thy nature there is more to be seen. In thy nature a beauty untold. In thy nature is earth. In thy nature I find my worth. When I set out for the Valley of Flowers, as an avid lover of nature, I expected as many experiences along the way as I hoped to find in the ultimate home of myths and mystique. I began my journey at the pilgrim city of Hardwar, gateway to the abode of the gods, the Himalayas where my promised land of nymphs and fairies was tucked away. The temple city of Rishikesh reminded me that we were moving upwards, perhaps towards greater spiritual experiences. The confluence of the Bhagirathi and the Alakananda at Devaprayag begins the flow of the sacred waters of the Ganga. Yet another reminder of the land of legends ahead of us. The shrine of Badrinath was another assurance that we were approaching hallowed ground, consecrated by centuries of faith. The magic mountains beckoned us further as one magnificent visual experience followed another. But the road was increasingly more challenging. The climb more exacting. The Valley of Flowers was still a long way ahead and it would make many physical and mental demands on us before it revealed itself. Along the road from Joshimat, we drove 22 kilometers to the mountain village of Govind Ghat, from where our ascent to the Valley of Flowers would truly begin. trek of 14 kilometers brought us to the cozy hamlet of Ghangria, our last contact with civilization. Ghangria welcomed us with a few hotels with basic amenities and a gurdwara where pilgrims could rest en route to Hem Kund, sacred to both Sikhs and Hindus. Thousands of pilgrims are drawn every year for a holy dip in the Lokpal Lake, on whose shores stand the Sikh shrine of Hem Kund Sahib and the Hindu Lakshman Mandir. We looked forward to a good night's rest at Ghangria, rejuvenated next morning 
we set out for the Valley of Flowers. We took a diversion from the pathway to the Hemkund Sahib to the gates of the National Park. It was the start of a three kilometer trek to our ultimate destination. We went across the bridge over the Pushpavati River towards the valley. Our progress to paradise had been slow and demanding. The rigors of the trek instantly vanished in the fresh, fragrant green. What seemed like any other Himalayan meadow was transformed into a magic land of colors from thousands of blossom. I truly felt like a trespasser into a haven of ethereal beauty. Spread over 8,750 hectares, altitudes here range from 3,200 meters to 6,700 meters. The valley itself runs east to west for almost 15 kilometers, with a width of about 6 kilometers. The bewildering variety of flora is present in three zones the subalpine zone at the tree limit, the meadows in the lower alpine level, and the higher alpine level above 3,700 meters. Perennial snow and glaciers cover more than 70% of the valley. The Saptashring peak stands at the south of the valley. Mount Rataban and Gauri Parvat, the highest, tower across the Bhaindar Pass in the east. The Nilgiri Parvat stands in the north, while Nar Parvat stands over the northwest corner. The Kunt Khal glacier descends from its peak on the west under the canopy of magical clouds that move across the valley sky. The gorge located towards the southwest of the valley gives enough space for the clouds to drift in. Their contact with Gauri Parvat causes rainfall in the region. waters of the Pushpavati river that tumbles through the mountain valley further enrich the moist soil. Snowbound for most of the year, it begins to thaw with the early spring in May. Till October, the valley is witness to the invasion of flowers. During the four months of bloom, visitors come looking for rare and exciting species. The call of the mountains brings climbers, while others arrive looking for tranquility and peace.
the British mountaineer and botanist Frank Smith discovered a valley of peace and perfect beauty quite by chance on his return from Mount Comet. The title of his book gave the valley its name in 1937. Joan Margaret Legg from the Royal Botanical Gardens fell to her death in 1939 while collecting specimens. She is blessed with her last resting place in a garden of enchanting flowers. History may forget her, but Mother Nature will always keep fresh flowers on her grave. The valley has been the grazing ground for the local people since time immemorial. But none of them have ever lived here because they believed this was the playground of the fairies. The Ramayana legend has it that the Sanjeevani herb found here saved the life of Lakshman who prayed in gratitude at the Hemkund Lake, where a temple stands today. His penance pleased the gods, who showered him with divine blossoms. That was how the Valley of Flowers began. The valley is home to over 600 species of flora. Many of them are rare. Some have proven medicinal properties. During the blossoming season, the floral composition changes every few days. White anemones may be replaced by the bright pink of balsam, spreading its hues across miles of meadows. The anemones, most common in the valley, have petals that open at sunrise and close at sunset. The roots and leaves of the geranium wallichianum plant provides medicine for headaches and wounds. Potentilas, known as Vajradanti, is used in toothpaste. The roots are also applicable for cuts and burns. The Himalayan blue poppy has long been crowned queen among the Himalayan flowers for its heavenly color. The attractive shape of the saline flower cannot miss your attention. Though snakes are not found here, the cobra lily is a pleasant reminder of the predator of the plains. The rhododendrons I saw would soon bloom into a profusion of red and pink. Among the other flowers I encountered were the bright yellow candle flower, the dactylorhiza, the morena, wild roses and the highly medicinal rheum. The predominance of certain blossoms lead you to think that the valley has only few kinds of flowers. But you'll spot a fascinating variety if you stop to look. 
and the closer and longer you observe, the more you will find. The variety of shapes and sizes, hues and fragrances could not escape my notice. I remembered a description in Frank Smith's book. In all my mountain wanderings, I have not seen a more beautiful flower than this primula. Among the 31 rare and endangered species of flora found in the valley, 13 are medicinal in quality. The local people take advantage of medicinal properties in 45 of the plants here. The legendary Brahma Kamal, the celestial blossom offered to the goddess Nanda Devi and to other deities, is also known to grow in the higher regions. The official flower of the state of Uttarakhand it has an all-pervading fragrance. The Valley of Flowers was declared a national park in 1982. Its unique ecosystem prompted UNESCO to identify it as a World Heritage Site and the United Nations Environment Programme designates it as a Centre for Plant Diversity. As a result, grazing is banned, human habitation prohibited. It took time for the local people to appreciate reasons behind the loss of their traditional grazing grounds. But their natural sense of ecology led them to establish the eco-development committees. Today, they help forest officials keep the environment free of the garbage left by careless tourists. Larger dangers loom before our planet. Bigger hazards like global warming threaten the snow line and the glaciers. In the midst of such crises, I realize that the delicate balance of nature in the Valley of Flowers has an uncertain future. To me, its value increases further. The heritage of the Valley of Flowers is too fragile to be left without protection, too beautiful to be ignored, too valuable to be forgotten, too sacred to our people and their faith. My journey of discovery was one that led me to enthralling beauty with a reminder of responsibility that comes with every inheritance. The Valley of Flowers is too precious to be lost. <laughs> 